Mr. Lucas, I uh, had, have to say that you have first excellent panel with, with brilliant speakers, and I would like to wish you very successful start today with uh, this very challenging topic about business environment in financial sectors. So I would like to wish you all very great many ideas, new ideas, and successful day. Um, so I'm Edward Lucas, and I'm a senior editor at The Economist magazine, and I've been coming to Riga for nearly 25 years now. I first came here in January 1990, and I followed the development of the um, financial system as well as everything else here with great interest and also um, affection and sometimes worry. And I've seen the, the highs and the lows of the last uh, 20, 24, 25 years. And it's a great privilege for me and very interesting to be able to chair this session. Um, I'm not going to give you um, any particular thoughts of my own right now, although I may um, intervene during the discussion um, with some questions. Um, I just want to say that the, the, there are only two rules. Um, one is that please turn off your mobile phones, because although Latvians have beautiful ringtones on their phones, it's much better not to hear them during the discussion. Um, and secondly, when we get to the discussion, you're very welcome to make your remarks in Latvian or in Russian. Don't feel you have to speak English. Um, there are a couple of us here on the platform who don't speak um, Latvian, but we have an excellent interpreter here who will help us. So please feel free during the discussion just to concentrate on making the point you want to make rather than thinking about how to say it in English. Now we're going to go in order of, from, my, from my left, from your right, starting with Mr. Liepinch. I've asked all the panellists just to speak for as close to five minutes and as far away from ten minutes as they can manage in order to leave um, plenty of time for discussion. Um, everybody, each of the panellists is going to speak on their particular area of expertise and then we will start um, discussing that um, when the presentations have finished. So, Andres Lepinch, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, government will, uh, so to say, government will lead discussion. Also, <laughs> often we want to uh, rather observe and, and regulate markets, but not lead. But uh, um, just will give, um, from government point of view, kind of brief assessment of uh, financial sector, and as I believe what are most important uh, further steps we have to do. Uh, I will start and uh, Han and uh, Christophs will, will follow yeah, on this, uh, on steps to do. Basically on a few figures and main facts on financial sector, we see that the uh, financial sector uh, is comprises 3.3% of GDP, uh, which is lower than EU average, which is nearly 5%, so we have a uh, as a financial sector, way to way, way to go in relation, kind of in proportion to GDP. Also, uh, financial sector of Latvia kind of uh, is rather uh, representative in our export structure. In total export of uh, services, it's uh, about 10% of our services. And what is important is that it was a double-digit growth we experienced during the last year when export uh, when export. Uh, of financial services uh, grew by uh, nearly 12%. Also, by the way, uh, relative to uh, uh, kind of comparing to financial crisis uh, situation pre-financial crisis, uh, it's a few only one uh, only sector which experienced uh, uh, kind of uh, where there was uh, job creation was uh, or jobs. Uh, Kind of employment is higher than it was uh, prior to financial crisis. Kind of this is, uh, and uh, and altogether about uh, 22,000 employees are uh, working in financial sector. And the uh, financial sector, as you know, also experienced or or, or not just experienced, but enjoying the uh, highest uh, salary level of uh, of all uh, industries of in economy. So all in all, also uh, if we look at uh, uh, banking sector performance, that uh, uh, quality of loan portfolio is improving. There is increasing uh, um, deposits, including non-residents. Also, liquidity ratios are historically high. Uh, capitalization of banks are very strong, and uh, 
it, it kind of only thing in this rosy picture which would we would wish to wish to have that the credit expansion would be also uh, stronger. But what we see also we see that uh, there is uh, deleveraging is continuing, and uh, credit expansion is rather is I would say not rather weak, but still still if we comparing year to year, then it's negative. And uh, from other point of view, we also have to see that, uh, that, that there are uh, not just supply factors, but also there is demand factors, factors that like uh, low capitalization of uh, of uh, companies, companies and ability companies to borrow, also regula regulations the financial sector to become stronger, which uh, as well as recently. Recently, also, uh, external situation is becoming weaker, so preventing from uh, expansion of credit, which is necessary for further growth of economy. But there is all, all see we do, what we see during last year, there are some more fundamental things like, like, um, like we, kind of, there is awareness in EU that, uh, uh, that EU has been over-reliant on banking sector during last year last years or previous uh, decades and, uh, and and this is uh, trend seems is changing and and uh, there is a kind of overall assessment that there is need for more private equity venture capital more alternative sources of financing uh, to the economy what would be kind of what we see main main priorities uh, for uh, for the for the government besides uh, those uh, fundamental things like keeping macroeconomic stability being better in uh, uh, all possible indices like uh, like world economic forum doing business indexes we have to be kind of where we have to perform uh, better uh, and especially what what we have to, to do to sustain growth, we have to have uh, more innovations in economy. And in order to have more innovations economy, again, uh, I have to mention that private equity venture capital uh, part is uh, essential. And uh, regulations to uh, private uh, to venture capital and kind of improvement of, uh, of operational environment, including tax breaks for for venture capital and private equity funds have to be introduced um, in order uh, to uh, to decrease dependence on private on, on public co-funding for uh, uh, for uh, venture capital and private equity over the last years with uh, cooperation with European uh, investment fund there is a number of initiatives been launched in venture capital private equity market, uh, either on on Latvia's level, or on pan Baltic level. As you know, Baltic Innovation uh, Fund was created, and now kind of five fund teams are selected, and over 300 million uh, euros will be uh, well, is already kind of funds are funds one of funds are operational, and over 300 million euros will be available for private equity uh, over next years. We have to cooperate more with uh, European Investment Bank and, and EF further also to, uh, to develop uh, uh, private equity venture capital market. And, uh, and, and on, other, on supply side, on demand side, we have to be kind of, we have to support uh, activities, kind of common common platforms uh, 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 between finance supply side and demand side. Support activities like uh, commercialization reactor, tech hub activities. These were uh, uh, which are essential for uh, startup ecosystem, and these are kind of most uh, kind of, uh, uh, to to minimize, so to say, minimize uh, financial gap, but also a kind of market. Uh, uh, imperfections in area in area of startup. So, and during NAC next uh, year, we'll be selecting uh, several more fund managers in uh, in uh, uh, kind of early stage venture capital. Uh, and uh, this would be probably on on next forum will be when we're reporting just uh, kind of like last year we selected three more fund teams. Uh, in private equity part, and next year I will be 
hope I will be uh, able to report to you that three to four more fund teams are selected in, in uh, early stage venture capital private equity market. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed um, for that, and particularly for um, ending up on this question of uh, improving the investment environment. And I think the, um, the, from an outside point of view, um, the more um, you can focus on the tech hubs and things like that, um, the, 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 the more um, the easier it will be to attract outside interest. So I'm going to go straight on to um, Anna Dravnitsa um, from the uh, uh, head of the Financial Market Policy Department from the Ministry of Finance, who had the first of all the Economics Ministry, now the Finance Ministry. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Speak right into the mic. Right. Um, I will have only then two minutes after um, Leipzig's entrance. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to say that um, government uh, this spring approved financial sector development plan and um, mainly the objective of the plan is uh, to facilitate the stability of financial sector that itself could in, uh, contribute um, the uh, sustainable development um, of the economy of the Latvia. If you look closer to the measures that is stipulated in the financial development plan, then uh, both uh, these uh, measures um, are focused on both um, development and competitiveness and also as well as um, uh, preventive measures um, for ensuring stability. Um, measures that are uh, more focused on development and competitiveness uh, is such as uh, capital markets development, um, promotion of transparent sale of uh, capital stakes in uh, companies, uh, um, um, you, 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 through instruments uh, such as uh, public offering and uh, quotation, also, there is uh, um, measures for um, uh, risk capital funds uh, to strengthen risk capital funds, um, creating by uh, new risk capital fund management teams. And uh, also, uh, we are preparing and working on uh, a new tax regime for alternative uh, investment fund. Um, Regime. Also, there is the access to development finance will be uh, improved by recently created single development. Um, this single development um, institution mainly will uh, focus on uh, uh, market gaps filling. And uh, also, we have added insurance sector uh, that requires additional research on uh, covering uh, professional and uh, business. Um, um, civil responsibility and risks. Also, we have included preventive measures, and mainly we are focused um, on conservative policy and what it means uh, from policymakers' side. Uh, conservative policy, uh, we understand and we um, support that now additional stimulus for financial uh, service exports, such as, such as a non-resident deposit, rather curbing the risks uh, on micro and macro level. Uh, we have included uh, measures uh, like improvement of non-resident deposit structure, setting stricter requirements for demand deposits rather than uh, term deposits. Be because if we compare like with the Benelux countries such as Luxembourg, then we see that um, we have demand deposits nearly 90% uh, of uh, we compare with the term deposits, what is more than 50% in Luxembourg. Uh, so we, we see that there is still in the room place for risk management um, rather to expand. So um, we, we, we have come far, but still we'll have work to do. Thank you. Um, thanks very much indeed for, um, for that, and particularly for keeping your remarks so brief, which leaves um, e even more time for the discussion, um, and also for Christoph Zakalis, um, who has a very big job indeed in keeping a, an eye on this from a supervisory point of view. Um, over to you. 
thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my colleagues from ministries already touched on statistics and development plans and uh, measures taken. So I will be not duplicating the ideas already expressed. I will just reassure that, uh, of course, we as regulator understands that the, we have a combined financial sector, so the banks who are working on the resident market and the banks who are exporting financial services. Uh, we still apply appropriate measures depending on the risks inherent in those business models. And I will reassure that that will not change with the entering into a force of the SSM. So if somebody uh, hoped that SSM will somehow change the landscape on the regulatory environment in Latvia, then uh, not so much. Of course, uh, SSM can be used as um, some a uh, good element to show... Just in case there's someone in the room who doesn't uh, know what SSM sorry, is. Sorry, uh, just sorry my mistake. Uh, too much dealt with those abbreviations. SSM, single supervisory mechanism. So the 4th of November, I repeat the date, uh, when we will uh, see it uh, stepping into full force. And actually... Uh, so, of course, um, <clears throat> those of banks which will fall under direct supervision of SSM, so namely three biggest banks in Latvia, I uh, will then repeat Swedbank, SCB, and ABLV, will definitely uh, expect not only to pay for the fees, which is usually when something new instrument is invented, but uh, get some returns on it. Uh, for the uh, banks who are dealing with residents and who are the uh, as a group banks providing the Baltic banking services, definitely the benefit would be uh, having actually one regulator to speak in Frankfurt uh, with one regulator is much better and maybe easier than speak with three separate regulators. So I guess some issues could be solved on the same manner, despite that we already as national competent authorities has uh, acknowledged that still we are small Baltic countries, but we have our differences in our regulatory environment. Uh, for the non-resident banks, of course, it's uh, uh, actually, it would be very interesting to be under the SSM umbrella, uh, together with the names like uh, Deutsche Bank and some other big names. Uh, so be in between those 120, which uh, falls under direct supervision of the SSM. Um, but uh, maybe I will proceed a little bit with some reaction on, on, on those uh, comments. Uh, uh, stronger regulation, uh, it's a uh, look on the other perspective, despite the fact that regulations are becoming much more complex and uh, much more stronger. Um, still, we have in both segments on the resident and non-resident sides, banks with pretty reasonable level of return on equity. Uh, some top performers uh, has gained this year about 30%, some 34 or something like that. You can imagine that uh, sounds great for the shareholders, despite the fact of the stronger regulation. And my other comment would be related with, uh, uh, it's, uh, I would say it's some... Uh, burden of the civilization. You can imagine, just take a passenger car 25, 30 years ago. I'm not asking how does it look, the passenger cars in the Riga 25 years ago when you first uh, came here, but uh, uh, look on such a things like airbags, ABS, or the security belts. Uh, would you be ready to step back in the car without anything of that? That would be my comment. Thank you. <coughs> Great. Well, um, thanks, thanks very much for that. When you've driven a financial BMW, you never want to go back into a financial larder. Um, so um, I, now my pleasure to ask um, Ilona Gulchak from uh, Baltic International Bank um, your um, thoughts on the previous speaker's points and uh, maybe some of your, your own as well. Thank you. Thank you and hello everyone. 
um, yes, uh, really, I'm a representative of uh, the private sector, and um, I'm really uh, proud to represent a uh, financial industry here in Latvia because uh, uh, I think it's highly intellectual industry, well regulated, as we all heard, uh, with a significant contribution uh, to the Latvian economy, and uh, I think uh, that we are all benefiting from uh, uh, the multifaceted uh, industry that we have, that we have uh, uh, different banks uh, having different business models and uh, focusing on different uh, uh, clients' niche. Um, I will not probably start talking about the clients' benefits um, but which we, they are getting from uh, uh, being serviced, uh, serviced in the financial industry in Latvia because they know their benefits, that is why they are with us. I will probably, I would like to outline some figures uh, uh, about the contribution of the financial system to the Latvian economy. And if you can put uh, the first slide on. Probably I will repeat a bit uh, the figures that were mentioned by uh, Mr. Lepinch, uh, but I think it's important to understand uh, uh, the contribution. Uh, so 3.7%, this is the contribution, the direct contribution of the Latvian financial system to the GDP. According to different sources, uh, the indirect contribution can be uh, calculated at the amount of 10%, which is a significant significant amount. In terms of taxes paid by the financial industry, it's 4.4% uh, uh, of the total government budget. In terms of employment, 2.5% uh, of the population of Latvia is employed in the financial, in financial system. Yes, these are significant numbers, but uh, I can assure you if we are developing our sector in a wise manner, this figures uh, can be enhanced and increased. Uh, another aspect I would like to touch upon is the uh, inflow of capital into Latvia. If you can uh, switch on the next slide. Uh, the, we, can, we have experienced the inflow of capital in, uh, in many different manners. One of them is uh, the deposits that, we, that were already mentioned. And uh, we have historically had a, a split between the resident deposits and international deposits. Uh, and the historical split is 50 to 50 around this number. Um, we have uh, seen over the course of uh, uh, the recent years uh, that there were inflow investments into the real uh, estate sector into the financial industry itself in the form of the subordinated debt which contributed to the uh, capitalization level of the banks which is an important thing uh, in order to provide stability for the depositors. Um, how the financial se sector influences uh, other sectors of economy? Well, it's a significant influence because <clears throat> other businesses can emerge and develop uh, and flourish around the financial services. And we can talk about the legal and tax advice, about accounting uh, services, about tourism, about the construction industry, about the real estate sector, uh, health and recreation, and we can continue more. Uh, and I think we all should understand uh, this uh, benefit for Latvian economy. Um, an important thing to talk about is uh, the provision of lending facilities to the enterprises here in Latvia. Uh, and I would say that uh, this is a twofold uh, uh, aspect of this. One is that the banks and uh, financial institutions should be ready to provide uh, facilities. But another aspect is that the environment should be viable to uh, actually enable the creation of the businesses, the enable of the creation of the projects uh, uh, which will be seeking these investments. And I think that the financial institutions in Latvia should uh, seize every opportunity to retain the capitals which uh, have been attracted to, to Latvia in order to be invested here, in order to stay here and to work for the best of, uh, of the economy. Uh, that will be uh, another aspect. Uh, it is good to hear that we have uh, a financial uh, industry development plan and it is good to have the, the development of the capital markets because uh, uh, using the alternative uh, financing sources for the local businesses uh, 
uh, and the international businesses that can that can be placed here is is an important factor, and we are not uh, talking only about the. Um, uh, IPOs uh, in, in in our markets, but we can also talk about the alternative financing like peer-to-peer -peer, uh, financing or crowdfunding, uh, which is a popular way of attracting financing in other markets. Um, having gained great experience uh, working with uh, international clients, uh, I think we can further capitalize on. Uh, we can actually create uh, the environment where the uh, uh, business process outsourcing companies and shared services centers can be placed in Latvia. As we are looking now how the economy is developing and multinational corporation, uh, corporations are seeking uh, of decreasing uh, the administrative costs, uh, placing business process outsourcing into other countries with lower administrative costs but simultaneously with the uh, labor force which is uh, highly professional and developed and multilingual and we, actually we can offer this in Latvia. We haven't been successful in this regard if we are comparing uh, to other countries. Poland can be mentioned um, as a success story because they first started um, this business in 1991 when the first business process outsourcing company was uh, created there. Uh, at the moment they have around 400 companies working in this sector and uh, around 150,000 people are employed in this sector. So you can imagine that we have really an, an untapped potential uh, here in Latvia. It is good uh, hearing that uh, we have in our plan to develop the uh, technical cups and uh, reactors of commercialization, which I suppose uh, is another important and interesting aspect for, uh, for our economy. Another one uh, which also should be mentioned that we should help other, our enterprises to um, enter international markets, uh, helping them with the relevant financial instruments because we want to support them in their exporting uh, activities. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, um, Ilona, particularly for mentioning the alternative um, financing and peer-to-peer, -peer, which I hope we can get onto a bit in the discussion. And I would encourage um, perhaps the representatives from the government and regulatory um, side just to think um, what they might say um, in response to a question about um, how that should um, develop and be regulated in Latvia. But now it's time for a, a view from, um, from, from Western Europe, um, and I'm very pleased to um, pass the, the floor to uh, Dagmar Linda, who's the Managing Director for um, Eastern Europe at Deutsche Bank. Over to you, Dagmar. Thank you very much. Allow me just to say one word to Christophs, and uh, I don't want to disagree, but I happen to have two cars, one 29-year-old Mercedes and a new one, <laughs> and I prefer driving my old car. <laughs> but in essence, I'm with you. On banking, I'm with you. Uh, now, I want to compare a bit the Western European banking system, how it has evolved, and um, the Eastern European banking system. And um, suffice to say, the Western European banking system is actually shrinking, will continue to shrink. Growth prospects, unfortunately, are dire, while here in Eastern Europe, they are a lot better. It's a growing market. Now, what are the changes that the finance sector is undergoing? <clears throat> First of all, banking is a bet on the economy, and Western Europe is growing so-so. Um, Western Europe, as Eastern Europe also, has gone through the re recession of the financial crisis, crisis in Eurozone countries. Now, lots of crises around Middle East, Syria, etc., uh, but the crisis which has most effect is obviously Russia, Ukraine. Deutsche Bank has reduced its economic growth models or economic growth forecasts for the Eurozone recently to 0.8% to this year and Germany 1.5% this year. The emerging markets, meanwhile, are expected to grow at 4.7%. Banks have shrinking revenues and low earnings currently. Shrinking revenues, also a consequence of the financial crisis, the low interest rate environment. Costs are stubbornly high, 
and loan loss provisions still are out there. Then, particularly for Western European banks, there are the so-called uh, operational risks. I call them litigation and fines, just to give you some horrific numbers. Uh, until the end of 2013, 10 key banks around the world paid $250 billion since the financial crisis. So, retained or earnings are extremely low, and in fact, EU banks have made net losses over the three years in the last six years. And then there's the vast area of regulation, and you know all about it, higher tier one ratios, higher capital ratios, higher leverage ratios, and EU banks have had to increase their capital by 300 billion euros, since the beginning of the financial crisis. At the same time, they have deleveraged enormously and have reduced um, their risk-weighted assets by 3.6 trillion euros, so 3,600 billion euros. And it's going on, banking separation laws are out there, banking resolution laws, that will change the banking scene tremendously. And the banking seen in Europe is trying to adapt. Before the financial crisis, everyone wanted to be more or less a universal bank, be present globally with a strong investment bank. And a lot of the banks have actually scaled back. And uh, the three kind of main business models that emerge up to now is um, the regional banking model, boutiques, so regional banks focusing on their local clients. I would say that kind of that's the model of the Baltic banks. Um, boutiques, kind of investment banking boutiques offering special products only. The global monolines, so offering one business segment to clients worldwide. And then there's uh, the universal banking model, Deutsche Bank, all clients, all services around the globe. And that gives me an opportunity to introduce Deutsche Bank very quickly to you. We are present in 72 countries. We offer retail investment banking, transaction, private wealth management and asset management services. In Central and Eastern Europe, we're present in 12 countries out of 30. We offer mainly investment banking and transaction banking only in Poland retail. Unfortunately, the universal banking model is the one which the markets, the financial markets, um, like the least currently. <laughs> our price book multiple uh, is 0 0.6, so our market value is less than our equity, while, for example, the regional banks, if I take the Nordic banks as an example, they are valued at 1.5, which means um, their market value is higher than their equity. Same for a global monoline, UBS, 1.2. How did uh, banks in Central and Eastern Europe develop over the time? And uh, we heard Andres mentioned uh, quite a few numbers already. Some of the same topics, uh, financial crisis, uh, recession, uh, banks came into problems. And overall, it's fair to say that the banks that were owned locally had the most problems and oftentimes had to be taken over by their governments. Parix Bank is an example of that. While the Western European and Nordic parent banks uh, stayed dedicated to their subsidiaries in Central and Eastern Europe. They recapitalized the banks, they provided liquidity. But they did not provide the same, of, uh, the same liquidity level and the same capital level as before. The transfer of essentially Western European savings was sharply reduced to Central and Eastern Europe. And banks in Central and Eastern Europe have adjusted. Uh, the non-performing loans are being worked through. Loans to deposit ratios are falling. But uh, in a number of countries already, loan volumes are rising again. Fortunately, the deposits are rising faster. 
and um, Central and Eastern Europe in general is a growth environment. Although the mm, GDP growth numbers for Central and Eastern Europe uh, for 2014 are not so impressive at 1.6%, for next year better forecast of 29 But it's fair to say that Central and Eastern Europe <coughs> has very has a lot of countries that develop very differently and the Baltic countries here are the example of the countries that are currently growing the most at 4% um, this year. Next year, our forecast, the EBRD, I understand, has reduced recently that probably due to Russia, Ukraine, but still it's, it's growing. These countries are growing a lot more than Western European countries. At the same time, um, the banking sector is still kind of under um, banked, if you want. Just to give you a number there, total assets to GDP, total banking assets to GDP in Central and Eastern Europe are at 85% and in the Euro area at 260%. So overall, um, the banking sector in Western Europe is adjusting. The banking models are being adjusted, but it's clear that um, the banking sector is reducing. And in Eastern Europe, the market, the banking market remains interesting. It will be the growth market for banking here in, in, in Europe. And um, again, the market gives the same indication. Polish banks, for example, are valued twice their equity, so their price book ratio is twice their, their equity. And just as a reminder, uh, Deutsche Bank 0 0.6 and other European banks at 0 0.8. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks very much indeed, Dagmar, particularly for that really interesting statistic. I'm reminded that when I was a student in Germany in the uh, 1980s, the phrase for a real disaster was Polnische Wirtschaft, which can mean either Polish pub or Polish economy. And it's amazing to me to think that uh, the Polish, Polish banks are now valued more highly than, than, than the mighty Deutsche Bank. Um, but I guess that um, this is, uh, um, th this is uh, perhaps a sign that uh, Deutsche Bank is very undervalued rather than the Polish bank, or maybe the Polish banks are overvalued. <laughs> um, so I'm now going to turn, to, and, and, and thank you also, by the way, for mentioning Parex. And I think when we get into discussion, one of my questions, particularly for the um, Latvians on the panel, um, would be what are the lessons of Parex and Citadella, particularly as we now seem to be coming to the, the end of the saga with the Ripplewood acquisition? What, has, um, what lessons has Latvia learnt and what lessons has Latvia still got to learn um, from, this enormous, um, from this enormous financial um, d d disaster of a few years ago? So that's a question for discussion. You can start thinking about it now. But in the meantime, um, Stephen Young from KPMG, over to you. Thank you, Edward. Uh, my task in these few minutes is to uh, draw your attention to the impact of the export of financial services, call it non-resident services or international services, to help you understand the impact of that on the economy in Latvia. <coughs> Excuse me, to look at the potential opportunities that brings if it, it is desired to, to expand those services, but also to remind everyone of the risks that are attached to these services. KPMG provides a number of services to a lot of financial service clients in the Baltics. And one of the services that we are involved with involves the production of a report that looks at the impact on the macroeconomics of Latvia. And we do this in conjunction with a number of different parties. Uh, last, our report last year w was uh, issued up until 2012. 17 banks provided data. The FCMC also provided data. And then we used international experts uh, to produce a report that seeks to uh, outline this impact. And I want to spend just a minute or two on that. And I also have a presentation, just two or three slides. And if we can have the next one, next two, please. Then go to the next one. The beauty of statistics is that we can come up with different statistics for the same purpose. And I have different ones to Ilona, but we can discuss that afterwards. Um, but our studies, based on the assumptions used in our report, indicate that the direct contribution of this uh, international banking service, the non-resident sector, is about somewhere between 0.7 and 1% of the Latvian GDP. That makes it not insignificant. 
And that contribution is uh, direct, it's commissions, it's foreign exchange income, but it's also indirect in the salaries, the taxes uh, that are paid to the 2,000 people approximately that work servicing uh, non-residents. A little bit of a background. Latvia um, attracts 72% of the uh, international deposits flowing through the Baltics compared to Estonia and Lithuania. 49% of those are demand, uh, the rest uh, are, are term. But there's been a growth in the last three years of 19% average per annum. Latvia is still attracting uh, non-resident deposits um, and those deposits are believed also to be a source of funds, funds for bank lending. They don't just necessarily flow through immediately. The, Latvia has 39% of its GDP in, in deposits. The EU average is 36. <clears throat> so Latvia is very similar to the EU in its average. But if you compare it to the UK, <coughs> excuse me, or Netherlands, where they have 211%. So the purpose of that statistic is to identify that there still remains, in my view, an opportunity for Latvia to continue to develop as a sub-regional hub in this area and to attract um, appropriate uh, deposits uh, from international services. Could I have the next slide, please? This is my last slide, fairly complex, but on the left-hand side, it looks at competitive advantages that Latvia has. And that includes a history of serving such clients. Uh, bordering the CIS, which is where the majority of these clients um, source their funds, even if the companies aren't registered there. The knowledge and understanding of which has always been referred to, language and culture, the significantly increased regulation and monitoring of the, of the FCMC and the role it has played in developing anti-money laundering um, policies. That is critical, um, but it still is not necessarily diminished the flow of funds into Latvia. I think there are a couple of comments I want to make on that, and that if this is seen as an opportunity, uh, for Latvia to continue to develop and to increase its contribution into the GDP, one must be aware of the risks. There are clearly risks associated with um, export of services. Uh, Rumours are regular um, and back as far as 2005-06, Latvia had significant issues dealing with uh, anti-money laundering accusations. But a lot of progress has been made to the extent that in 2012, uh, Moneyval and in 2013, the US State Department complemented Latvia on the, on the um, comprehensive framework of anti-money laundering policies it had in place. But the awareness is that um, it is a dynamic and sophisticated uh, business and therefore there's a lot of creative ways of trying to flow money through and therefore anti-money laundering needs to keep pace with that or at least get ahead of it uh, and therefore there are initiatives coming through where more focus will be placed on, on customer due diligence, identification of beneficial ownership, and of course the, the a review of domestic politically exposed people, PEPs as they're called, all form a relevant part of ensuring that you manage the, the reward of uh, export financial services, but also the attendant risks. And it may be surprising that uh, a representative of a, a big four advisory and accounting firm is, is suggesting that this is or could be an area for development of Latvia, that of servicing uh, non-residents. Uh, I think it is, but I think it goes alongside the need to be rigorous, to be transparent, and to be continually developing the anti-money laundering uh, rules and regulations um, that need to happen. The responsibility is with the banks in my view. The regulator has a responsibility to monitor, but ultimately the responsibility to handle the risks and know your customer rests with the banks. But if we can balance the risks and the rewards together with the fact that Latvia does have a stable economic environment, has certain tax advantages, and possibly could develop a, a sort of a holding company regime if it wished to, that, together with the ability and the customers it has in the non-resident sector, I think could be a platform for further discussion. But as I say, it must be balanced with a rigorous uh, and effective anti-money laundering uh, program. 
Thank you. Great. Well, um, thanks very much indeed, uh, Stephen, and thank to all the panellists for keeping their remarks short and for showing admirably uh, a small number of slides as well, which is a great habit and should be another Latvian export. Um, uh, so um, let's just have an idea of, um, if, you, if you're thinking of asking a question, perhaps you could just uh, try and catch my eye or put, put your hand up so I can see. Um, how many uh, questions we're going to have from the from the floor? And as I said, you're you're welcome to ask questions in English or in Latvian or in in Russian. We have an um, excellent interpreter here. Um, but my 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 first two questions, and I might just go around the panel um, with with those, um, were on um, alternative finance and and the lessons of Parex. So let's start off with with the the lessons of that. I guess probably everybody in the room, apart from me, Stephen, and Dagmar is a Latvian taxpayer. At least I hope you are, and um, that means that you are on the hook for this, for the, for the cost of this of, of this bailout. So I'd ask, starting starting at the far end with with, with Andres and then working here, what are the what, what would you say are the biggest lessons Latvia's learnt from the Parex Citadel episode, and are there any lessons you think are still to be implemented or still to be learned, Andres? From Parex, it is it clearly mentioned at the beginning that. Uh, that macroeconomic keeping macroeconomic fundamentals is important. Kind of keeping economic balance is kind of critical for the government. You know, if it is, uh, we're talking about uh, kind of macroeconomic kind of uh, uh, stability is essential for, for not creating bubbles. Another, another, it is on government side, of course. Another is regulators. How strong are regulators, and how how can kind of efficiently and quickly they react on in in, in situations if these kind of uh, Financial kind of kind of if still there is a risk of instabilities uh, or mentioned rumors or other things, how how they how they quickly are reacting to those situations, and um, and overall kind of uh, there was a number of uh, kind of steps being kind of uh, kind of as you know we went through kind of financial stability pact kind of observing budget deficits. How sustainable is the fiscal position of countries? These are kind of most important things. And other things probably Christophs will add what are what are what have been steps in regulation being amended, but these are kind of on government side is a macroeconomic stability and not kind of letting bubbles to kind of to to be created. Great. So that that was that's a, a very important point that the that to maintaining macroeconomic stability and preventing bubbles developing is the fundamental, um, the basis for the stability of the banking system. Anna, uh, I would like to go broader, not only on Latvian level. What we have lesson learned, um, what we have lesson learned from uh, in um, European Union level, because if you look. And the lesson learned from European Union level, uh, the injection in loans and the capital uh, is totally um, half a trillion. It's 671 um, billion in capital and loans injected into banks in the crisis period. So the answers for um, lesson learned we can find in single supervisory mechanism, in single resolution mechanism, in bank uh, resolution recovery directive, especially in these last two um, regulations, uh, where it's set up a new architecture not to uh, involve taxpayer money, but uh, hedged by the investor uh, or private sector money. So I think that's the main important thing for, from the lesson learned. So if, so if if there was another, God forbid, but if there was another crash or collapse of, of, a, of a bank dealing with non-resident investors, then there would be a Cyprus-style solution uh, would, would, would happen rather than a, a Parix-style solution. Right. Yeah, uh, good to know. Okay, Christoph. Um, I will try to summarize that um, in Parix's case, uh, it showed that you cannot handle three big problems at the same time, uh, the freeze on the market, so to solve your liquidity, um, syndicated loans, which were, the world has changed actually, and if the bank run has started. So all those three big problems, uh, Parix doesn't withstand it. Uh, what we have learned, and there is no syndicated loans on the banking books anymore. Actually, this market has been gone. 
Um, the second, uh, roughly, I would say, uh, two and a half, three times higher level of liquidity as it was pre-crisis and understanding what is sufficient. Uh, yeah, there is still uh, open issue when there is some bank run taking place. Uh, that was not only the parks, we had some other uh, historical examples when just from the pure rumors you can land in some smaller or mid-size problems. Uh, that's uh, still uh, to be transparent, to speak with your customers, to speak with general public and not to allow the rumors to be spread. Yes, I will uh, probably add a short comment uh, from the private sector and probably continuing what uh, Stephen had mentioned about the responsibility of the banks themselves. And I think it's important uh, to manage risks that you have uh, uh, in your portfolio, to manage the market risks, the liquidity risk, the credit risk, and uh, probably the contagion risk uh, uh, to not to create these bubbles and uh, spillovers. And uh, this is another huge responsibility which uh, stays uh, with the bank, so not just uh, the anti-money laundering risk. Good. Well, th thanks, very, thanks very much for that, and I'm, I'm very keen to take some questions. So was, um, if everybody was happy with that answer, that's very good. But if anyone wants to um, raise further points regarding that or anything else. Yes, there's a gentleman over there. Can we have the microphone? Do you, I think someone's going to bring you a microphone. Yes. And if you could introduce yourself and say what institution or uh, your, what affiliation you have, that would be very good. Yeah, uh, my name is Gerd Sungainis. I'm going to uh, be in charge of next panel actually here. Uh, my question is uh, continuing or maybe putting an end to uh, concerning the Citadel, which right now the Latvian government seems uh, has managed to sell. Um, we we don't know for, for sure, but we heard that... Uh, the bank, which has the equity of around 140, uh, projected to be around 160 at the year end, is sold somewhere around 100 million. Uh, or, and if the charges will be additionally taken, maybe lower than that. And we heard from Dagmar that uh, the level for a regional bank, which has been cleaned up, should be somewhere around 1.5 maybe, or certainly uh, somewhere between two and 300 million euros. So why the Latvia is taking the hit? why we have a discount. And who, who's the question addressed to? Um, generally, whoever prefers to answer. Would, 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 any, would anyone from the government side like to um, answer the, this question about the ex seemingly very large discount that's been applied to um, Citadella? It's almost as badly valued as Deutsche Bank. <laughs> There's probably, uh, he could be answering uh, on his own. He's also this question is, uh, he's also participating uh, in uh, this uh, tender in advising some of clients uh, for the, or been advising some of this. And he knows what is a history of, uh, uh, and what are kind of, uh, were conditions put on government when initially government uh, bailed out uh, Parex and created the good and bad bank. Citadel and Reverta, and he knows also what is uh, kind of what was uh, conditions set on government and time frame in which government had to sell 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 this bank, and uh, and either government is as he knows also the same as or either government is selling based on those conditions on which bailout of that bank been made, or either uh, European Commission is taking DVST who would be selling this bank on, on Latvia's behalf. Probably he knows all these answers to this question, but still it's an uh, interesting question to ask. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to go into the specific of, of Citadel here, and I don't know enough about it. I just want to um, say generally, something which I couldn't uh, mention in my little speech because Edward was putting such time pressure on us. <laughs> but um, Western European banks actually divested uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, except for uh, their subsidiaries in the countries which they considered as strategic. That may be you know, one explanation. I think it's a difference between how the... Mm, 
capital market, the kind of uh, um, treats and, and uh, treats shares towards a strategic investment of a bank. Shares on the stock exchange are traded by financial investors. But uh, if a bank takes the decision to become an equity owner, that's a different decision. So <clears throat> that is one point. And then number two, it's always very difficult to speak about the price of an acquisition of a company or a bank. And as I said, I don't know anything about um, Citadel here, but I remember in my very early days at Deutsche Bank, uh, I worked at um, our Munich branch, and that was the time when, when um, Germany reunited and we had loan requests from Bavarian companies that wanted to buy companies in East Germany, and they bought it for one Deutschmark. And afterwards, the discussion was, did they buy at an adequate price? Should, have, should the price have been higher? But everyone forgot that these companies actually had to clean up, for example, the soil, et cetera. There were costs involved for taking over, which you couldn't see by just taking the price, the acquisition price. Stephen, you wanted to come in on the I wanted to come in on Parex, actually, but perhaps life has moved on. You know, well, it, the only comment I would have added to lessons learned from Parex is that it, 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 Parex was systemic to Latvia, and therefore the response at the time uh, was uh, dependent on that position if another bank were to fail other than through uh, fraudulent means. Uh, then it may be a different situation. But the other lesson, I think, it emphasized asset quality importance. You know, balance sheets are assets on one side, liabilities on the other. The, co the emphasis on looking at the quality of the asset and not burying one's head in the sand um, as economies change, I think, was also another lesson learned. Coming back to Citadella, uh, I'm not going to say anything uh, specifically other than general statistics can uh, distort the matter. Uh, the market will set the price. Uh, where there is a transparent and open tra uh, um, disposal process, which I understand to have been the case in this particular case. So my own view would be that the market sets the price. It's up to the seller whether to accept it, um, but the market will have determined the price. Good. Well, th thanks so much. I, I want to ask about alternative financing um, next, um, and, but we may, might take that together with another question if the if there is one, don't feel shy. But let's talk about about peer-to-peer -peer and crowdfunding a bit, because this is in this very bleak background in the um, so-called Western Europe, which you've been talking about, Dagmar. Peer-to-peer um, -peer is the one really fast-growing thing. It's, uh, I think, growing. In some of the peer-to-peer -peer lenders are growing at 10% a month, and we see this not only in Britain with Zopa and, uh, and so on, but also in North America with Lending Circle. And your northern neighbour, Estonia, has what used to be called Isipank or now um, Bandora, which is, uh, I think, doing peer-to-peer -peer lending now in four or five countries across Europe and growing very fast. Um, so I'd be interested to hear from the from the private sector um, people, how they see the growth possibility, and from the um, government and regulatory side, whether they think the regulatory framework is already in place for peer-to-peer, for, for -peer or if there are any changes. But um, let's start. Stephen, do you have any thoughts on peer-to-peer? Uh, very few, actually. <laughs> um, uh, to be honest, uh, we have had very little exposure to that up in this part of the world, very little interest in us uh, evaluating a business, which is where we initially would look in. Uh, suffice to say that recently, uh, uh, KPMG has received its first request to, to evaluate a, a crowdfunding organization in this part of the world. So I will learn a lot more over the next few weeks than I know now. So the, for the 21st Financial Forum, maybe we can have a session on crowdfunding. Yeah, same here, very little. Uh, I wouldn't know what Deutsche Bank's um, opinion is on it, so I'll try to give you my own, and it's a bit skeptical. Risk management for on peer-to-peer on -peer lending. Uh, risk management is an art, not a science. Um, you have to have a feel, you have to look into deeply into numbers, you have to judge people, acting people, and so I'm a bit skeptical on peer-to-peer, -peer, and let's see uh, whether whether there'll be some 
hiccups in that. If so, I don't see too much of a future. If people lose money, if they don't lose money, wonderful, I guess it'll continue. On crowdfunding, also I cannot um, say very much except that a friend of mine is doing that for, um, how can I put it, um, kind of solar panels, et cetera, that he's financing. And I think uh, there he has either dedicated investors coming onto the crowdfunding platform or his friends and family. And, uh, but I think that sector will develop, but it will also depend on how professional the, the providers, uh, the, the, in, the ones that handle the invested money will be. Uh, my opinion is that uh, if there is an interest to place funds and if there is an acceptance of certain level of risks, I think that uh, there is a potential and huge potential for development of this uh, sector in Latvia as well. Because banks are limited in their abilities uh, to accept risks. We are really well uh, regulated and uh, uh, there are certain projects that we cannot involve in. Uh, but this doesn't mean that the project is not uh, uh, successful in the future. And uh, if we just put two parts together, then we see that there is an untapped potential, especially for those uh, companies uh, who are just starting up. Uh, we do have uh, tech hubs here. We do have commercialization reactors in Latvia. And there are uh, uh, companies which are seeking not only startup investments, but also pre-seed and seed money, uh, and then they would need uh, funds for uh, further development, and not and sometimes they are not uh, uh, able to attract venture capital and I investors, uh, so a solution for them might be the crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer financing. So yes, there is a room for, for, for the development, and I think we should follow that path. And from your bank's point of view, does is the regulatory framework all, all, all already there if you wanted to? Um, develop, develop something like that. Uh, it depends on the capital level. If the bank need, need, wants to involve in such uh, an activity, then uh, probably the banks would need to top up their capitals for such kind of, a, of an activity. Yeah. Uh, Chris, from, from, from your point of view, pe people say that, I mean, I've heard people say that peer-to-peer -peer crowdfunding are an accident waiting to happen, and when it goes wrong, um, everyone's going to blame the regulator. Is this, how, how do you see it? Yeah, that's usually how it works. The regulator there is always a uh, fault once and uh, they are um, closing banks uh, whether too late or they are closing too early from the shareholders perspective so there is always a regulator that's why they are invented to be uh, at least to take some attention back from general public um, also the branch is growing uh, and in I would say in relative terms uh, pretty fast it's still those numbers are so small and business volumes it's still some i would my personal opinion some geek uh, business in the sense some fancy idea boutique boutique style like in opposite to the big names and to that we smaller ones can come together the neighbors can come together the unknown persons can come together and provide the funds for for very uh, small and simple things so um, let's start to keep it simple. If you want to make it complicated, let us rule. Uh, you will receive the, all the investor protection in full strength with, with all the requirements on transparency and all the checklists and all the paperwork which is needed. Uh, I would uh, assume, uh, till now everyone from the regulatory perspective is looking cautious on such a developments. There is some other areas like virtual currencies and some other things which the web platforms allow to be born and used. and. Uh, uh, again, regulators are a little bit behind, but until it's uh, small by the volumes and is not uh, becoming a big player on the market, uh, I would prefer to keep it simple. Um, uh, I will be very short. Uh, I think uh, we still ne uh, have some space to improve legislation in this area, and um, that will be a test of time um, for improvement to, to use these um, instruments. Yep. 
That's, that's for government, it is important to, as um, crowdfunding uh, business angels, kind of, uh, kind of peer, peer to peer financing is, will be increasing, it is increasing like, um, you know, business angel financing is already kind of by volumes, it's larger in Western Europe than uh, private venture capital funding and will be increasing also further. And kind of for Latvia, it's important to create platform for developing of uh, business angel network. Recently, with, uh, we were kind of been initiating creation of uh, our Latvian guarantee agency was initiating creation of business angel network, which is uh, important and becoming more important uh, source of financing for uh, startups and uh, uh, and for early stage financing. Next, clearly is the same as in the UK and in Western Europe, legislation not to be late, <laughs> legislation how to be <laughs> ready <laughs> also for uh, crowd uh, crowd funding. Uh, it, is, uh, it is important as will become more important, more and more important source of financing in the future, especially for uh, early stage venture, venture, venture ideas. And um, we are devoting currently quite a lot of attention and also resources and assisting in creation of ecosystem and uh, where people can gather between kind of supply and demand in early stage. So legislation soon will be necessary in order not to be kind of, or, or to create who would be kind of in crowdfunding and it's important educated investors who would be those educated first investors who are investing in order not to kind of uh, spoil or lose. This is a, a, a in future as important source of financing. So this is uh, first of all, of course, our kind of uh, main role would be create supply and interest. And then we hope regulators will react soon. Thank you. Super, right. Let's have, let's have I feel that um, we must be doing something wrong up here if you aren't asking us questions. So please reassure me by putting your, ha putting your hand up. Yes, go ahead, the gentleman over there. And if you stand up, the microphone will... Yeah, my name is N.G. Spiegel, and my question to Latvia and our panelists is, uh, do you really see Latvia and the region in particular as growing uh, financial center, a regional center providing services for uh, non-residents as it was proposed? And if yes, I hope your answer is yes. What steps should be, uh, should be taken? So what, what uh, risks do you And what benefits? Okay, so um, what steps still need to be taken to make Riga into a financial centre? What are the benefits and what are the risks? Well, I guess the benefits is everybody gets richer. But let's so let's talk about the uh, um, the steps and the um, and, and and the risks. Do you, do you have a? <laughs> Thank you. I thought we already a financial centre of, of at least of Baltics <laughs> has been mentioned in terms of uh, non-resident deposits attracted uh, and also export of services and financial services. We are you know, far far ahead of Estonia and Lithuania, and we remain because it's a natural because of also uh, size of, of Riga's uh, natural centre of Baltic states, also well developed infrastructure, kind of uh, developed banking sector, and this is a kind of accessibility of Latvia and all kind of all this stuff. Other mentioned kind of factors, which are natural for creation of, of uh, or for development of, of Latvia's financial centre. Another thing which also been mentioned by Mr. Young that is important also kind of strengths of uh, regulation and kind of and this is uh, would be again I mentioned in earlier stage not to create kind of uh, bubbles and and uh, kind of segments which are not kind of properly regulated but uh, it is on financial side on other side remain we we've been kind of uh, also a champion or leader in uh, private equity and venture capital back 10 years ago probably now Estonians Lithuanians are catching us or Estonians are claiming that they are kind of now further away still Latvians was once uh, who kind of initiated the Baltic Baltic in innovation fund which is in cooperation with other Baltic countries been created so still that that we have to can kind of maintain the same pace we have to run fast in order to to be a uh, kind of and, and another thing which is still kind of I sometimes struggle to kind of mention to investors, which is a unique uh, selling proposition of Latvia in financial sector, which been kind of besides kind of general environment, which have been first factors I mentioned. But uh, this is a kind of unique selling factor is in the financial area is how to be kind of, uh, kind of proposed by a financial and banking system. 
Thank you. Well, I might just add before Anna uh, picks up on that, um, we should also be looking, I think, at the the context of the of the crisis of the, of the sanctions on Russia and Russia's move um, to kind of move away from um, the process of integration that we've seen over the past 20 years. Um, the crisis in Ukraine has made many Ukrainians very nervous, so they want to um, diversify um, their assets and put, uh, put, put money abroad. You've got lots of Russians who, want, who are very nervous about the future. Um, but on the other hand, Latvia is seen as a frontline state, and so it's also, to some extent, seen as more risky. That you're, closer to the, you're closer to the action. That's a, both a benefit and a, um, and, and a worry. So how, how, do, how, how do you see Riga's future as a, as a financial center in, in that context, Anna? Uh, I would agree with uh, Mr. Lepinch already said that we are already in the financial center. We have already built that up. And of course, financial sector is um, a vital liquidity provider. Uh, but at the same time, what I mentioned in my previous um, intervention that it's important that we haven't just short money, but we can pro uh, attract long-term money. Uh, just uh, that on this situation, the banks are more like safe wallet. But uh, if we compare with the uh, Luxembourg, uh, there is a long-term uh, different uh, deposit structure uh, attracted. So I think that's the uh, main focus what we need to uh, find a way how to change the deposit structure. Right. Yes. And, 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 and practically, how? We, but I, I mean, uh, in, in, in practical terms, that's um, that's a, a nice to say. Every bank would like to have uh, people lending for very long long periods of money. But would, is that something you would do from a regulatory point of view, or is it? Um, um, how, how, how is it going to happen? Um, probably. Christoph's going to go in uh, deeper details, but there is some um, possibilities how to that improve uh, through liquidity pillar second um, uh, requirements. Okay, so how do we turn the hot money from being um, too hot? How do we turn down the temperature? Uh, actually, uh, I maybe will um, return to this uh, sentence I used already that regulators are lagging behind, not in the sense that we are late, but the business is usually in the first row and we are looking over the shoulder, we are breathing in the head from the behind and uh, actually all those mentioned already pillar two requirements we are adding, that's more to prevent, to start again to think about to use the hot money in the long term investments which were not successful business model which we observed in the financial crisis times. Actually, so about how to convince the customers to keep some part of funds uh, in much longer term or switch from the man deposits to uh, some other forms of uh, liabilities. That's already we observe those uh, attempts to, uh, there is bonds issued in pretty, uh, I would say, significant volumes and they are reissued uh, for, for more than many hundred euros already that the volumes has reached and that's why those are figures which were not uh, something uh, who the bankers would dream about some five, seven years ago. That was too far uh, future, I guess. Uh, so our focus is uh, not to maybe what is usually keen that, that I would say that the bankers, sorry to say, but they have short memory. They always, after they were hardly hit, they try to come back and search for this profitability and try to even play those uh, games again. And so we as regulators, our role is to just remind them that, sorry, that I'm, so, I could even say that, uh, for example, that recent tensions on the Eastern uh, direction. Uh, so, first of all, there was Crimea, um, and then there was some maybe a little bit calmer times. There wasn't uh, so recent activities in the eastern part of Ukraine. So, already we heard the comments from the bankers, some of the bankers, that, oh, the Crimea crisis is over. So, in the sense that, that there will be no further development, so we should start again, look more on, on some profitability gains on the eastern directions. We said, no, just wait, let's, let's wait. And there is, there is no clarity that 
everything is over. And it took some few weeks, and there was, again, tensions growing up, and uh, then was this sudden, uh, this flight down, uh, MH, uh, which one? Uh, so actually, it's still, again, a little bit to uh, remind the bankers. The bankers will always look for the profitability, and so I would just remind that's the, how the thing is built up. The bankers will look for the profitability, for this gain for the shareholders, uh, through, of course, servicing the customers, and we as regulators is just having, uh, looking over the shoulders that the bankers really acknowledge what's going on. So it leads me to those risks. Uh, one of the risks, of course, is the head of the bankers. In the sense, what are their uh, attitude towards let's uh, gain few years, uh, some about 30% return on equity or work for 10 or 20 years with some 10, 12 or 15 <laughs> return on equity annual. So it's again a little bit, it's about depends from the thinking and are you uh, looking in the nearest future or are you trying to build up sustainable business model, then it will lead to Riga, uh, how it will be written in the history books as just uh, one moment it was a regional financial center or it lasted much longer. So that would be my answer <laughs> about the Riga. Say again. Just one of your proposals, or you said that the heads are over. It's one of the risks, it's uh, their attitude, yes. So the bankers should, uh, you know, their first half to, uh, to mitigate the risk is to acknowledge it. If you are denying it and saying, no, it's just the happy year for me, it's about 30% of return on equity, and, and, and then as a year, oh, again, I was the happy one. So to understand where are you driving for and, and how long are you going to drive is your BMW, your Mercedes, or your Lada. Uh, thank you, but actually my question also was, uh, like I was hoping that uh, you mentioned some missing parts, like for example to become a real financial uh, uh, center, we would need I think, to develop uh, maybe insurance uh, sectors or something else, and maybe... Yes, sir. Well, I think in, in, um, the, in, Ilona is going to respond both to the um, question of whether your head is properly on your shoulders. Um, and oh, sir. <laughs> Um, and also perhaps what you're noticing in business trends um, from the east and also this point about broadening the base and developing things like in insurance. So go ahead. Um, yes, um, I think if uh, clients entrust us with their capitals, <clears throat> they are seeking the return on their investments. And we cannot uh, speak only about the return on the equity for the shareholders of the financial institutions. And uh, with only with regulation, we actually cannot force our clients to uh, have our funds placed with us for longer terms. We should offer them investment opportunities. And uh, if there is is uh, a demand, there should be a supply. And uh, for the banks as well, uh, if uh, the deposits are placed for longer, we need to understand where to invest those money in order to be able to pay the return on the deposits. So that is why uh, an important factor is uh, developing the business environment in Latvia so that more companies uh, are emerging here. Uh, so they are offering more projects to invest into. Uh, we need to actually uh, develop the uh, taxation system we have in Latvia in order to uh, reinvest the profits earned here in Latvia. Uh, so we have incentives for the businesses to reinvest their profits here. Uh, we should develop the uh, insurance sector, as, as you have mentioned, uh, so that the financial sector is not, is not just about the banking. It should be about the capital markets, about the insurance sector, and about the alternative financing and I think the uh, development of the alternative financing funds here uh, is also a, a platform for the discussion and uh, there should be a regulation and should be a developing of the legislation in order to succeed in the uh, creation of alternative investment funds here and in, in their efficiency here. And I think sustainability, which was mentioned by Mr. Zakolis, is a very relevant term for our economy. We should think uh, sustainable and both in terms of banking and in terms of developing the businesses here. And, and what specifically 
do you need? If you were writing the next government's legislative program on regulating the um, financial sector, what would you want to see in it? Uh, as I mentioned, the incentives for the businesses to reinvent their profits. So it could be decrease of uh, uh, the taxation on, on the corporate income uh, for those who reinvest profits. Uh, one of the examples is Estonia. They have... Um, zero tax for the reinvested profits. I'm not saying this is a perfect tool, but this is the direction we should look at, into. Uh, because if the business is created here, uh, they already start paying taxes uh, through the labor force taxes, actually, and the government actually starts receiving uh, revenues right away. And uh, actually, that is why it is possible to uh, decrease the taxation rate on the corporate income tax. Uh, um, the legislation in the dispute resolution uh, can be improved. Uh, that will be the thoughts right away. Okay. And um, Dagmar, look, from your point of view, do you think it's realistic to talk about um, Riga as, as, as a financial hub? Because although it seems a big place when you're, when you're in it, the entire population of the Baltic states is smaller than the sort of greater Katowice conurbation in southern Poland, which you also um, do, do business in. So what, what do you think is, is the realistic aspiration um, here? And where, where, should, where should be people be putting, putting their bets, if you, given your perspective from looking at the whole region from, from, from north to south? <clears throat> so what's... Um realistic in terms of um, kind of financial hub here in, in Riga. I find the Latvian banking system quite interesting. It has banks, oftentimes foreign owned, that focus on the local clients. And then it has the non-resident money, oftentimes banks locally owned. Um, the the local or the banks focusing on the local market, they will profit from everything um, um, Ilona said and, and what what's being planned here. Um, the two banking sectors together, as I said earlier, are only around 85% or total assets of the, the two banking sectors together are only around 85% of uh, GDP. Now Luxembourg, which was mentioned, Luxembourg, which was mentioned, and I'm not saying this should be the model, but I think it's like, yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, immense, immense. And um, I don't think that's, you know, that needs to be aspired to, but that's kind of what other financial centers offer in terms of total assets to, to GDP. I believe that Riga, all the Baltic states, have a natural advantage to other countries, which is their closeness to Russia, Ukraine, etc., Belarus. And uh, now maybe it's uh, a bit seen, given the crisis, as a risk, but I, I see it as an opportunity as well. And uh, to grow that more, I think, is is a good a strategy. It just needs, as, uh, as Stephen mentioned, to be closely monitored, careful, etc. So I, you know, I would very much support um, that way forward. There's room to, room to grow. Um, one needs to be careful. That's, um, that's all you know, I'd, li I'd like to add here. I'm going to come to Stephen in a moment. I just want to go back to Ilona. Just to, um, from your position as a, as, as, a, as a private sector banker, what are the effects you're noticing in terms of the growth of business from Russia and from um, Ukraine and, for that matter, Belarus? Do you, has the crisis um, brought you more clients or is it scaring people away or what, what's happening? Mm, well, yes, it's uh, actually we are experience uh, Latvia uh, experiencing the inflow of uh, funds, uh, as I mentioned uh, in my first uh, part. Mm, 
um, that there is investments into the real estate. Uh, the inflow of capitals have supported construction industry. Uh, people are coming to live here. Uh, they are coming to have their businesses here. And actually, that's what we can capitalize on, of course, provided the fact that the, the risks are mitigated and the regulation is in place. But yes, there is a certain number of industries which is benefiting, not just the financial industry. And uh, financial industry uh, can be uh, seen as the industry itself, which contributes a lot, and also providing the uh, services to other industries to, to flourish. Good. And, um, Stephen, um, your thoughts on all those. And also, if you just want to expand a little bit on the idea of um, Latvia as a place which could develop a holding company regime, uh, but maybe not everybody here is completely familiar with that. Could you um, outline that in a bit more detail, what that would mean? First of all, if I just add a comment to Ilona from uh, from the advisory sector, if you like, uh, we we haven't seen a drop off in interest in Latvia either. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, new initiatives didn't start. We also have an election here coming up shortly, and inevitably, when you have an election later in the year, that does. Uh, the distance immediate investment decisions because they need certainty. And, and while <coughs> the politics and econ economy here is relatively stable, it's not always un seen to be that um, uh, abroad. But more to your question. Um, I raised the issue about setting, you know, considering setting up more of a holding company regime uh, here, recognizing one, Latvia has the skills and experience in servicing uh, non resident businesses, two, it is a transit country in many ways. You know, it does border the EU and CIS, and therefore it is transiting goods capital and funds. And therefore it has a, a, a unique set of <clears throat> a unique set of situations, although Estonia and Lithuania may disagree, but a unique set of opportunities, really. The holding company regime, I would see something like uh, the Dutch system, whereby through various tax arrangements and, and, uh, and co corporate structures, more business could actually be registered here uh, and ben not just be registered for the purposes of flowing, for the flow of funds, but registered for the purposes of headquartering, which in itself would help the economy grow. Uh, that, that, of course, needs transparent ownership rules, uh, because registering uh, where you have the existence of bearer shares or uh, nominal lawyers owning companies would not be suitable, uh, in my view. So I, I put it in the context of how can we leverage from the experience we have by setting up a tax regime uh, which would allow more groups of companies, whether they have their businesses in the CIS or Europe, to headquarter themselves here in Latvia. I, I can't really comment more about the detail because it, re it requires the fiscal uh, regime as well, but I see it as a, a natural opportunity to consider. Would, it, would any, any, as a sort of final point then, would any of the Latvians on the panel like to come back on that? Would they, would they see that as a tempting opportunity or, um, and from a regulatory point of view, something that is, is doable or would create more problems than it, um, than it solves? Let's, let's hear, hear some thoughts. Ilona, do you have a... I would uh, definitely add on this. And uh, um, I would like to say that um, foreign clients are setting up their companies in Latvia, including uh, they are, um, of course, considering this uh, um, transparency uh, aspect of this, and they're ready to uh, set up their businesses in a transparent manner and operating from Latvia uh, with their international holdings uh, uh, and using the re the Latvia uh, the regime Latvia already has uh, in their international operations, uh, and we are not talking only about the asset holding companies, but also about the trading companies, uh, thus gen generating uh, more revenues. And I think this is uh, uh, a good ne good next step, which can be made uh, using the customer base uh, Latvian ba banks have managed to, to create uh, over the course of this more than 20 years. Thanks. Let me throw that hot potato to this end of the panel and see who wants to catch it. 
Okay, that's why we have financial um, sector development plan and the platform form discussed and we are uh, openly invite for discussed more in detail and pro, uh, pro and cons for uh, additional measures uh, or ideas um, and why demand and supply do not match in somehow, in some ways. Um, it's, so, well, we, we really would like to uh, discuss more in detail, uh, of course, what Stephen Young uh, prepared and uh, presented. Um, but um, I think uh, the private sector must take into account also the interest of whole society, uh, not only its narrow interest, but okay. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, if I may add one technical aspect, um, I would just uh, try to explain there is one myth running around that if those customers right now mostly use uh, different jurisdictions, um, starting from the BVI and ending with the Cyprus companies, um, as uh, some experience from, from end last century about hiding some identities or something like that, that's not true, actually, despite the fact which jurisdiction they are using, Cypriot, BVI, or even it will be the Latvian holding company, it's still about knowing and the bank's responsibility to know those uh, beneficial owners, and we are making our inspections and, and double-checking that really the banks recognizes what are the beneficial owners, despite the fact that their legal structure is used based on the specific projects they are attempt to uh, develop and uh, in which areas and uh, you know there is different double um, tax avoidance treaties between different countries different jurisdictions and uh, so and uh, still Cyprus will have some attractions if even the financial sector lost some attraction then the, this platform and this all those legal uh, setup which was already in place starting from, I guess, uh, 1990s already, <laughs> from the Soviet uh, former union uh, st style, uh, it's uh, still, we feel and see this attraction of Cypriot companies. Good. Well, thanks very much indeed for that. And I, I hope that Britain will reach Latvian standards in terms of enforcing ownership, because we still have the deplorable practice of issuing bearer shares for companies, which is, I think, a, 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 real, a real scandal. And I, um, Wish we could catch up you and uh, ca catch up to your standards and outlaw them. But anyway, on that note, we are now at exactly time for our coffee break, and I would like to ask you um, to join me in thanking um, all six of our, our panelists um, for their thoughts, and feel free to jump on them in the in the break and ask them the questions that you were too shy to ask during the session. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.